This video is supported by Lumerit Scholar. Who actually won the space race? The space race of the 50s and 60s pitted against each other two ideologically opposed superpowers engaged in a global cold war. It was technological genital measuring, each trying to one-up the other to show that their way of doing things was the best. But who actually won? If one means the first to get to space, then the Soviets won. If one means the first to get to the moon, then the Americans won. Of course, if you ask the Russians, they would say it's the first one. You ask the Americans, it would be the second one. It's easy to win when you get to decide what winning is. Well, today there's a new space race in the works, this time between private corporations, and their definitions of success are even bigger, more ambitious, and more world-changing. Well, you know a lot about one of them and the billionaire that owns it, but today we're going to talk about the other one, owned by that other guy. You know, the richest guy in the world. In an earlier video about the Falcon Heavy, I asked you guys if you would be interested in hearing about other space agencies around the world, and that idea was met with an enthusiastic huzzah! Because apparently my audience is from the 1920s. SpaceX, ULA, Blue Origin, Rocket Lab, JAXA, ISRO, ESA, and the Chinese Space Agency are all new contenders in this new wild west of space. All of them pioneering new technologies and economics around space travel, and all with different objectives. Over the next few months, I'm going to be talking about all these different teams, but today I'm going to talk about Blue Origin, the company founded by Amazon CEO and currently richest person in the world, Jeff Bezos. Much like old Muskie, Jeff Bezos had dreams of space flight from a very young age. In fact, when he was named valedictorian of his high school class in 1982, he was saying in an interview, quote, that he wanted to build space hotels, amusement parks, and colonies for two million or three million people who would be in orbit. The whole idea is to preserve the Earth, he told the newspaper. The goal was to be able to evacuate humans. The planet would become a park. And this kind of tells you everything you need to know about the difference between SpaceX and Blue Origin. Both of them believe that we need to sort of transcend Earth, but Musk wants to take us to Mars, and Jeff Bezos just wants to have millions of people living and working in outer space. Both of these guys are in their 40s and 50s working on the thing that they wanted to be when they were kids. If I was what I wanted to be when I was 18, I'd be a rapper. So Bezos' goal is to have millions of people living and working in space, especially moving heavy industry up into space so that the Earth can just be residential and recreational and light industry type stuff. And that makes sense. There's an argument to be made there. If it's in zero gravity, heavy industry might actually be easier to do. You might be able to build things a lot easier up there. Of course, you've got to get all that stuff up into space first. Enter Blue Origin. Blue Origin was founded in Kent, Washington in the year 2000, a full two years before SpaceX was founded. But whereas Elon made a big splash with mariachis and maracas, uh, Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin developed their rocket systems in secret for the first three years. In fact, nobody knew anything about the company until they started buying up land in West Texas to build a rocket facility. By the way, I'm a Texan, born and raised here, never lived anywhere else. I'm not really one of those super proud Texans that you see everywhere, but I do have to say, the fact that SpaceX, Blue Origin, and NASA all have major facilities here in Texas is supremely cool to me. I mean, the Texas accent is not generally thought of as one that is associated with intelligence very much, but if you go to any of these facilities and talk to one of their rocket scientists, they'll tell you that engine spits fire like a Baptist with a drunk raccoon. Blue Origin's motto is gratitum ferociter, which is Latin for step-by-step -step ferociously. And this actually explains their approach pretty well. It might actually answer the question that you may be asking, which is if they started two years before SpaceX, why are they so far behind? It all has to do with this corporate culture of baby steps, perfecting every little piece of technology before moving on to the next piece. And this may create a bit of an exponential effect. You know, it starts really, really slowly before eventually taking off. And there's reason to believe they might be at the beginning of this exponential curve. Much like SpaceX, Blue Origin's goal is to make spaceflight cheaper, and that means reusability. So whereas SpaceX had the Grasshopper test vehicle, uh, Blue Origin had Sharon. It was a low altitude test vehicle that they used to test their autonomous guidance and control technologies. This was only flown once in 2005 before it was replaced by the Goddard test flight vehicle, which was tested four times beginning at the end of 2006. Once they felt like they'd mastered the vertical takeoff and landing, they decided to put their efforts into the new Shepard suborbital flight system. And this is an interesting vehicle. Unlike SpaceX, which focused their efforts on satellites, launching satellites into orbit with their Falcon series, the new Shepard is going to be more of a space tourism vehicle, more in line with Virgin Galactic. In order for people to embrace living and working in space, first you have to demystify it, and the new Shepard is all about opening up space to the lay people. The ultimate goal for the new Shepard is to be something of a, an amusement park ride, a fully reusable launch vehicle that regularly takes people up to the edge of space, and it's built with that experience in mind. 
The interior volume of the crew capsule is 15 cubic meters and features seats for six passengers with huge windows so the passengers can get an unobstructed view of the space and the curvature of the Earth. The passengers would experience weightlessness for four minutes, during which they can float around or conduct experiments. The propulsion module is powered by a single Blue Origin BE-3 engine fueled by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, or LOX. It carries the rocket to a height of around 100 kilometers before it detaches and falls back to Earth, making a vertical landing on the launch pad. The crew capsule, after reaching the apogee, begins a controlled descent to the ground using parachutes with the landing made softer by retro rockets just before it hits the ground. The entire flight lasts about 11 minutes and is completely autonomous, no piloting necessary. The first test launch of the New Shepard was in April of 2015 and it went up to a height of 93 kilometers. The crew capsule landed softly on the ground with no problem. They didn't try to land the propulsion module this time, so it was expended. A second New Shepard, the New Shepard 2, first launched in November 2015. This time they landed the first stage successfully and then went ahead and shot it up again four more times. So it had five successful flights proving the reusability of the system. The New Shepard 3 was flown for the first time in December 2017 and this was a milestone because all the previous missions were flown under an experimental permit by the FAA which meant it couldn't carry cargo. This was the first one granted a launch license so they were able to carry 12 experiments on board including a dummy fitted with sensors that they named, yes, Mannequin Skywalker. Just a little over a week ago, on April 6th, they tested the escape system in mid-flight on the crew capsule. Further testing on the New Shepard 3 will continue throughout this year, as well as the debut of the New Shepard 4, which is going to be the first one to carry actual human passengers. That's expected to happen by the end of 2018. By the way, just a reminder, SpaceX has not even begun testing their Dragon 2 crew capsule yet. They're supposed to start doing that unmanned in August of this year, so it's quite possible that Blue Origin could beat them at getting people into space. Now you may think that comes with an asterisk because it's only suborbital, it's not orbital, so therefore it doesn't count. Fair argument to make, but that baby step strategy they have of perfecting manned spaceflight is going to set them up nicely for their next phase of orbital flight with their next rocket, the new Glenn. And whatever negative thing you might have said about the new Shepard that doesn't even reach orbit, that it's more of a space tourism thing, that it looks like a sex toy, all of that goes away when you look at the new Glenn. This thing is a beast. Standing 99 meters tall with a 7 meter diameter, the new Glenn will be the tallest rocket in the world, and the third tallest rocket ever built behind the Soviet N1 and the Saturn V, a full 29 meters taller than the Falcon Heavy. This is for a three-stage version. There's a two-stage version that will be shorter, both boosted by seven of their new BE-4 engines, giving it 3.85 million pounds of thrust, compared to 5 million pounds of thrust with the Falcon Heavy. But keep in mind the Falcon Heavy is the most powerful rocket in the world right now and the new Glenn is right up there. But because its diameter is literally almost twice that of the Falcon 9 core at the center of the Falcon Heavy, its payload capacity is off the charts. While Blue Origin hasn't put any official stats out there regarding their payload capacity, some estimates have put it at 70 to 90 tons. The Falcon Heavy's top load is 50 tons. So capability wise it's kind of like a smaller BFR which at 106 meters when the BFR gets built it will be the tallest rocket in the world but only by 7 meters. But enough about height, let's talk about those engines for a second. Okay, so the Falcon Heavy gets 5 million pounds of thrust from 27 Merlin engines, right? And the new Glenn is going to get 3.8 million pounds of thrust from 7 BE-4 engines. That's 3 quarters the thrust with only 1 quarter of the engines. There's a term that gets thrown around a lot when people talk about the BE-4 engine and that term is game changer. The BE-4 engine might be the key to Blue Origin's success. It's fueled by LOX and liquid methane, much like the SpaceX Raptor engine, but where the Raptor engine is expected to get 380,000 pounds of thrust, the BE-4 will produce 500,000 pounds, 32% more powerful. And this has gotten the attention of other companies, including ULA, who in 2014 signed a deal to use the BE-4 engine on their next generation Vulcan rocket. More on that in a future video. And this might be where Blue Origin becomes a profit generating company by licensing their superior engines to other rocket companies as well as the super heavy lift capacity of the new Glenn. Which back to the new Glenn, the first stage lands vertically and is reusable just like SpaceX's lineup and with its insane payload capacity it could actually bring the cost per kilogram of cargo down even more than the Falcon Heavy. Blue Origin just recently built a facility near Cape Canaveral to build the new Glenn, and even though it's still a few years away before they start launching it, they've already got seven launches on their manifest for UTELSAT and Mu Space Corporation. Bezos has already spent $2.5 billion developing the new Glenn. Luckily for him, that's cushion change, and the first launches are supposed to go up in 2020. As for the future of Blue Origin, well, some astute observers may have figured out that they named the new Shepard after Alan Shepard, who was the first American in suborbital flight, and the new Glenn is named after John Glenn, the first American who orbited the Earth. Well, their next 
spacecraft that is still in design is the new Armstrong. So you can kind of figure out where they want to go with that one. Probably a BFR type system designed to go to the moon and beyond, but they haven't released any specifics on that. It's still in the design phase. So while SpaceX has been dominating the headlines, Blue Origin has ambitions every bit as grand and have been laying the groundwork for that in the background, step by step, ferociously. We really are seeing the beginnings of a whole new space race, one that could be every bit as exciting as the one back in the 60s. A race fueled by visionaries with dreams of world transformation. In fact, in the far future, they may look back on this as the true space age and everything that came before it was just dabbling. But I'd love to hear what you guys think. I know we got a lot of SpaceX fans in the audience out there. What do you think of Blue Origin's plans? What do you think, would it count if the new Shepard beat the Dragon 2 into space? Do you think their plans make sense? Pros, cons? Talk about it in the comments. Now, if you want a job in the aerospace industry, this is good news for you because a new space race means private companies will be hiring, means more jobs in the aerospace industry. But before you can get the job, you gotta get your degree. And that's where Lumerit comes in. We all know the price of college is astronomical pun intended, but Lumerit is the smart way to plan for college so you can graduate from the college of your choice with as little expense and headache as possible. You tell Lumerit where you'd like to get your degree and they scan thousands of class offerings from hundreds of colleges and online institutions to find you transferable credits from less expensive online courses. And the transfers are guaranteed. It's like having a travel agent for your college career. If you'd like a faster, cheaper way to get your degree, you can get a free quote if you go to lumerit.com slash answers with Joe and you never know, it might save you some money. There's only one way to find out. Luckily, it's free. Honestly, when I first heard about Lumerit, I actually got a little bit mad because I just really wished they had this when I was in college. And actually, college was a lot cheaper back then when I went to college, so I can totally see how helpful this could be. So do yourself a favor, check it out. Lumerit.com slash Answers with Joe for a free quote. Thanks to Lumerit for supporting this channel and a big shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon who help keep the lights on around here. Can't thank you enough. There's some new members of the tribe. I want to give a shout out real quick. We've got Quentin Gradek, Canada Base, Roy Kamita, Sean David Byrne, same as it ever was, Will S, uh, Ajit Kumar Singh, Mercy Down, Timothy Knight, Melissa McPherson, Dave Armstrong, Dor Organ, uh, Edward Kellerman, Javier Gar Gracia, Stephen Warner, Lou, Michael, and Bo Rosen. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get access to uh, perks like secret vlogs and behind the scenes stuff and outtakes and all that kind of stuff, as well as just access to me, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. T-shirts available at answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. And if you like this video, I encourage you to like and share. And if this is your first time here and you're not familiar with my channel, please check out some of my other videos. You might like those too. And if you like those, subscribe, and then you'll catch all the new ones when I post every Monday. All right, thanks a lot for watching. As always, go out there, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.